After a lifetime of researching the dynamic and enigmatic world of light entertainment, I've decided to ditch my notebook and meet the people who inspire me. What makes them the people they are? How do they feel about the show business landscape in which they find themselves? And in a world where anyone can be a star, is there still a need for performers who have universal appeal? Come with me on a journey of discovery as I get a unique insight into Britain's favourite stars with a little help from my glamorous assistants. Yeah, well, I say glamorous, more like hazardous. And of course, we'll have a bit of fun along the way. Celebrated actress Leslie Ash has been a familiar face on our television screens for over 40 years, first appearing as a child actress in an advert for Fairy Liquid. Significant roles in the two Ronnies and a splattering of ITV sitcoms followed before being cast as Steph in the classic 1979 coming-of-age movie Quadrophenia. But perhaps her most celebrated role came in 1992 when Leslie Ash was cast as Debs in the flat-based sitcom Men Behaving Badly. I caught up with Leslie to talk comedy, acting and her hopes for the future. Ladies and gentlemen, Leslie Ash. We'll get on to the major highlights from your career in a moment, but one of the many interesting things about your career is that you were in The Two Ronnies, a sketch called Raiders of the Lost Orcs, written by the great David Renwick. Tell us a little about working with those two comedy giants. Oh, working with The Two Ronnies, God, it was such a long time ago now. I mean, I think I was 19 or 20, and uh, it was uh, Raiders of the Lost Orc rather than ARC, and uh, it was just an amazing job to be offered uh, to work with the two Ronnies uh, because they were enormous. They were light entertainment, you know, everyone tuned in to watch the two Ronnies, and uh, it was fantastic to be on set. Ronnie Barker was the one who was more the director, and uh, so he, he, he was directing it, in fact, um, and Ronnie... Corbett was the one I was acting with. He was meant to be um, the Harrison Ford character, Indiana Jones, which was hysterical. Um, and at the time, I suppose you don't really realise how lucky you are to do it, to be standing there with these two greats. But um, we had to run along this very, very high wall, I remember. And they sort of got planks of wood there so we weren't literally running along a very very narrow wall and uh, Ronnie Corbett just suddenly looked at me and he said uh, I'm really scared of heights I thought, this is great you know, he's meant to be Indiana Jones <laughs> and here he's telling me that he's really scared of heights so it took us a while to actually get it but it was shown not long ago actually um, and I spent most of my time running around in it it's, it's cream nightdress that's all I seem to remember and a wig so but great memories and I'm so pleased to have that box ticked having worked with Ronnie Barker and Ronnie Corbett and I just can't believe that they're not here with us now you know it's a big gap where that light entertainment should be in 1979 you were cast as Steph in the coming of age film Quadrophenia why do you think this film helped define a generation? Um, when, did, when did you say it was? 1979? Yeah, yeah. 1979. Yeah. Uh, I think it came out in 1979. I think we were shooting it in 78. So I was 18. Um, I had my whole life in front of me. And I was actually modelling at the time for an um, agency called Freddy's. And I was getting loads and loads of work. Um, I was doing Nivea, I was working with David Bailey, Barry Lattock, and all these amazing photographers. And then I suddenly got asked to go on this audition for Quadrophenia, for The Who. And The Who used to do like a big movie a year. They'd just done Tommy, and, and now they were doing Quadrophenia. Quadrophenia, in my mind, was one of the best Who albums. And um, although... It wasn't really the mod time, 1978, it was, it was way past 1964 where the film was based on. So I remember feeling a bit, um, a bit embarrassed having to wear these clothes out in public when we were filming and getting sort of like very strange people shouting and, you know, just, I remember just feeling real embarrassment sitting on the back of a bike with Phil Daniels on top of a, 
some sort of low loader going down Shepherd's Bush. I'm thinking, oh no, I hope none of my friends see me dressed up like this. But obviously now you look back at the opportunity and, and um, to do a film so iconic, when it um, first came out, it, it wasn't that much of a success. Um, it wasn't until a few years later when that whole 1960s thing came back into fashion that um, it was re-released and then it was an enormous success. And I think people like um, Paul Weller sort of really captured that film in his music, and there was a whole sort of, even with Oasis, they sort of encaptured that sort of movement, the mod movement in their music. And so I walk around now, and if I go and see bands like, one of my favorite bands is Kasabian, and I've got to go to see them live in Ibiza, at Ibiza Rocks, and afterwards, Tom came up to me and he went, oh, Pontefinia, yeah, I used to dream about you <laughs> when I was younger. I get that a lot. I've been sort of part of people's growing up, you know, I suppose. Um, but it was, again, very, very lucky to have done a film so, you know, it's one that everyone remembers and it sort of becomes part of their lives. And a lovely character, Steph, as well. You're also a celebrated model and posed for many celebrated photographers of the time, including David Bailey and Dave Hogan. In your opinion, on the subject of photography, who's the real artist? Is it the photographer or his subject? Um, it will be the photographer because he does, in those days, you, know, they, you used to go into a studio, you'd have the photographer and assistant, makeup, wardrobe, but everything, the director would basically be the photographer, like doing the film. He would set the mood that, you know, whatever you had to sell, whether it was lipstick or shoes or whatever, he, he would actually set the mood. So the artist is very much the photographer. Um, you just had to basically sit there and he would say, turn your head to the left, turn your head to the right. But you, not everyone can be a model. You've got to feel relaxed in front of a camera and... I think it's really important that eyes are very, very important. And you have, you can, if you stare at a photograph and you stare at the eyes, you can, you can, if you're a good model, you should be able to see something there. You know, you should be able to, you should work with the photographer to get the message across. Probably your most celebrated role came in 1992 when you were cast as Debs in the sitcom Men Behaving Badly. Originally an ITV early evening family vehicle for Harry Enfield and Martin Clunes, why do you think that incarnation didn't prove as successful as its eventual guys on BBC One? Um, when Simon Nye wrote the book Men Behaving Badly, he actually wrote the part of Deborah with me in mind. I don't know why, but that's what he said. Um, so to be cast in that so... Early, I still had to go for an audition for it though. Beryl Virtue was a producer. I had to go down and meet everyone. Um, but it was very much, you could tell from day one in the, in the rehearsals, it was very much a vehicle for Martin Clunes and Harry. Although Harry is really, really funny and him and Paul Whitehouse, I could watch them all day. Um, he's very good at, I think, writing his own stuff and performing it. It's quite difficult to perform someone else's stuff. Um, he might not have, and he was not comfortable. From day one in rehearsals, he was not comfortable doing it. He, and I think when Neil actually came in, it became an ensemble of four people. And before, it was, it was basically these two lads behaving badly and the women just was sat on the edge. It became a performance for... for I think Harry felt as though he had to pretend to be um, Dermot, was the character he was playing, which I, oh, I know that sounds silly because you all pretend to be those people. But I think with Harry, the character has to come from within. Um, so I think that's why that partnership wasn't that much of a success. 
When Neil Morrissey joined the show in 1994, it began a will-they-won't-they they scenario between Tony, played by Neil Morrissey, and your character, Debs. How enjoyable was that to play out? Oh, every day. Going into rehearsals was an absolute joy. We used to have such a giggle. Um, when it is the four of you, and Simon wrote it, we all sort of had the same amount of screen time, you know, whatever they, they call it. Um, I think we all relaxed into those parts so well. Um, and it was just an absolute joy to, to come in every day and to watch also how the, the relationships grow between Caroline and Martin, Gary and Dorothy. They had such a fantastic, strong relationship. And then the, with Tony, with Neil, with, no, Tony and uh, Deborah, it was always the, is she, will she, won't she, will he, won't he? And that, I was quite comfortable in that because it, when you're playing a straight girl, which I was, I hardly had any laughs, um, you know, you need to keep something going like that. So the day they actually got together, I sort of sunk a bit because that was half my part, really, that just gone out the window, really. Um, but so well written, Simon and I, it was just, it was just fantastic. We, we used to sit around the table like this doing the read-through and... Uh, we just giggled and giggled. It was a joy to rehearse. And um, the audience as well changed completely. At first, when you, I don't know whether you've ever been a studio audience. Yeah. Well, normally you get quite older people going along. Um, but it quickly changed to a lot of young people really wanting to come and see the show. And then once you've got that on your side, you become cool. You know, the whole show became cool. And... Uh, just I think people could relate it was the first sitcom I think that was actually quite real and about young people two guys living in a flat sniffing their socks before they put them on um, living in a mess you know I think situation comedies before were quite sort of stereotype middle of the road things so it was very much for the younger generation do you think there'll be any more Oh. We did Ben Behaving Badly when we were in our 30s. Now I'm the wrong side of 50. <laughs> um, it would be quite difficult. I don't know what would be there to offer, really, because it, it's really men behaving badly. I don't know if men behave that badly when they're in their 50s, do they? Might be men behaving boring. In 1998, you swapped the booze and blokes of men behaving badly for the residents of Slaithwaite in Where the Heart Is. How daunting was it replacing Pam Ferris? Oh, right. Well, it wasn't really replacing Pam Ferris. What they did was Pam was leaving, and so they wrote a character, auditioned for that. Again, that wasn't written for me. Um, lovely, lovely thing to do. A, I love Yorkshire because when my husband used to play for Leeds United, we lived up in Yorkshire and I just got a real love for the countryside and in where the heart is we spent our life every single day out in the freezing cold on the dales and stuff like that um, so I was in my element it was a really nice show to do um, Leslie Dunlop and I had known each other for quite a while so it was like working with a mate um, the show was just you know, it was tough. It was hard work, um, long hours, and with a young family at home, I had to, um, what's that, young? They were at school. Um, had to be away for most of the week, uh, come back on Fridays. So uh, that was quite difficult. It was the first time that I actually had to sort of leave home and go to work, but you know, it was it was fine. I mean, it was a, a great part to do, and um, things kept. To, Lee was at home as well, but and it wasn't all year round either. So it, it worked very very well. I liked it. How rewarding is it to head up a TV drama? Yeah, for the first time, um, I I was one of the headliners, which is what you sort of work for in this. In my career, I've spent 
best of 30 years, 40 years really, I suppose, 40 years carving a uh, career out for myself in a business that is very, very tough. So when you get the opportunity to head um, head a series like that, you take it very seriously, you work very hard, and um, you all you want to hear is, yeah, we're coming back for another series. Yeah, we're coming back for another series, and the ratings seem to be doing well. So I was, I did four years in Where the Heart Is, and every, you know, I loved every single series, yeah. So what's next for Leslie Ash? I seem to have played a lot of nurses, because I did um, Holby City as well. Um, I'd like to carry on really I'm obviously not working as much as I would like because a I don't actually know what it is it's whether or not I have in the eyes of everyone I have a disability when you first got in contact that you had the idea that I had given up um, acting to and I think that's a lot of people's a lot of people think that uh, when something like that happens to you that you you give up and and I think it's it's a shame that uh, for a while I think people in in TV companies were starting to use a lot of disabled actors and unfortunately I think it's sort of died down now um, and I, th I think from the the Paralympics people seem to be accepting it's, people were being more accepting of of a disabled person doing a normal part, not necessarily a disabled part. That's what I would like to see. I would like to see people being able to come in and do ordinary parts and not just be cast to do disabled parts. Um, and I, I think it was working, it was happening. Channel 4 definitely sort of got their mindset around it um, but just recently it's it's sort of like it's gone away a bit and I, th I th you know really would like people to keep it in them in the front of their minds still do you think that'll get better it's gonna have to but I still think writers have to be aware that there's a lot of different people in the world and um, not necessarily use these perfect stereotypes all the time. My age seems to be a disability in this business. Um, I'm 57 now, and uh, I've been spending a lot of time looking around. There's not a lot of parts for women in their 50s, which is sad, but people have to write them. There are lots of women writers now, people like Sally Wainwright, um, Sharon Horgan, people I'd love to work with. I think they, they write fantastic parts for women. Simon Nye as well. He's written The Durrells. That's having great success. I'd love to do some more comedy. Um, and Jed Mercurio, who did Line of Duty. They're all writing fantastic parts for women. So this is all a, a new thing. Um, so just, I spend a lot of time in the gym I have actually worked hard from not being able to walk at all um, to being able to walk without a stick now quite confidently. Um, so I'm sort of acting every day really, acting with my walking and stuff like that and I, I just have to keep that, that line of fitness. I can't stop doing it because if I do, if you don't use it, you lose it as they say. So. Um, I have to keep keeping fit, really, to enable myself to be ready for work because I'd like to carry on in this business. I love it. A big thank you to our guest for being the subject of another Beyond the Title interview. If you like this, why not browse the website and see if there's anything else that takes your fancy. Don't forget to like our Facebook page to receive updates of forthcoming interviews and to see more information about me and what I do. Thanks again and hopefully see you next time for another Beyond the Title interview.